Okay, Jamie Fuller, how are you doing, mate? Good to have you. Thanks, Brett. Really cool to be on. Thank you very much. I no, appreciate it. Now, listen, you're the chairman of EO, and I've started working with uh, EO, and I'm very excited about the products you're, you're putting out. Um, talk to us about EO. What is EO? So EO is an elite athlete performance company. Uh, we're not a swim tech company. It just so happens that our first product is in swim tech and in swim. Uh, but our primary purpose is to uh, accelerate a human, pro human pro accelerate progress through sport. And so we're creating a whole bunch of devices that are primarily for the elite level, but we know from uh, certainly my past experience in my previous company that when you've got something that's specific for the elite guys and it helps the elite guys to the point where it's not a question of them wanting your products, but they need your products, uh, we understand the ability then to make that available to what we call the serious amateur or the prosumer. Yeah, mate. and from my understanding, your background is is in kind of the sports performance. Um, you started the Skins Company, and that that all had to do with kind of the recovery of the athlete at the time, didn't it? Yeah, and that was the journey that sort of opened my eyes to the power of a genuine engagement with an elite athlete and with coaches. Um, that creates a halo over the brand. Uh, and in that case, we were only dealing in compression, and we were selling products uh, that enabled athletes to recover faster, which mm. meant they could push themselves. So it was one of these things where elite athletes, they didn't, like I said before, they didn't just want us, they needed us because that's their livelihood. And so when we look at our strategy today, it's frankly, it's the same strategy. It's just, we're not pigeonholed as apparel or as compression. We've got this wonderful innovation strategy that enables us to take advantage of all sorts of, um, all sorts of technology that are coming available in conjunction with research about what's moving the needle for elite athletes. Right. Uh, right. And then, like I said, that halo effect that it has makes it really relevant for age groupers, college swimmers, masters swimmers, and even triathletes. Yeah. May the question I get all the time is how are we continuing to get faster? How is it that a young man uh, by the name of David Popovich at 16 can come out 17 and break the world record in the 100 freestyle and people are, are just fascinated with this progression of per human performance in a way and it's like look, to me looking back 20 years ago when i was a professional athlete compared to where we are now it has a lot to do with the recovery the analytics the analysis of performance like really digging into how do you get faster why do you get faster um ways around other than just the physiology it used to just be go to practice, swim as hard as you can, go home, sleep, come back to it again. And that was kind of the, that was it. It was, it was, there was nothing more around it. Um, Australians have actually led the way in, in the sports science, uh, really progressing the sport uh, of swimming in a big way of, of really pressing on the science of performance as well, right? Yeah. So there's a, there's a number of things there to unpack, Brett. First of all, and it's a really big statement to make, and I don't know how far we can we can improve. I don't know at what point. So take the hundred meters, um, uh, hundred meters track. You mm -hmm. know what, what what are we talking about? You're saying I think it's nine point five eight. I mean, how far is that going to go? And at what point does it plateau? And at what point do we say we've exhausted the absolute maximum performance? Right now. I wouldn't be surprised if there were conversations happening 80 years ago saying, well, you'll never get to 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, I guess it's possible that's going to continue. I mean, you, you talk about the science and the science behind it. Uh, constantly we're seeing more research come out and constantly we're having to dive further into mm -hmm. the, the science and the research to see what we can connect and what we can do. Uh, and you mentioned Australia, Brad. I mean, look, it's by virtue of necessity. I mean, we sit here in the United States with a population of 350 million people around, and we've got a population of 27. And when you, whether you're competing against the English in rugby or cricket mm -hmm. with their population of 65 million and their sporting culture, or the United States with a population of 300 plus million, you, we as a small country in population size, not geographically, but we as a small country, 
need to be right at the top and super sophisticated in the, the approach to sports science and research. Right. So otherwise, it's, I mean, one of the things that sort of appears to me a little bit as an outsider in the US, certainly in swimming, is it's it's a bit like a, gr a meat grinder, you know, I mean, because there's mm -hmm. so many people that go into that meat grinder and, and the, the cream floats to the top. Mm -hmm. And my principal scientist and co-founder, a guy called Dr. Kenneth Graham, he said to me, Jamie, he said, you know, from an Aussie perspective, let's just hope that the Americans never get their act in again when, <laughs> when it comes to the sports science side of things because yeah. they absolutely wipe the floor with us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've been saying that for a while, like being living in America now for the past 16 years and, and then coming from the Australian system and seeing where that was going, seeing the progression of the Australian swim team, it was it was very heavy on the sports science. The American system is is based more around the physiology and, and maybe even the psychology, you know, around how to build team and how to be a leader and things like that. A, a very big part of the American culture and have, and have done wonders for them in terms of you know bringing people together and and um, getting them on the same page very quickly. And and that's very very useful. But the 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 way that the Aussies are really digging into the data has led them to be very competitive with the us to the point where yep. um they're, they're fighting to be number one na swimming nation in the world and and the world swimming championships are coming up next week and it's it's going to be a head-to-head -head battle of of kind of like the the sports science up against the the sports psychology so it'll be very interesting but um but you, you guys but, hmm? but, sorry Matt, it, it but the key is and, and you're right about that that whole team culture ethos yeah yep. You know, and having spent a bit of time here at the University of Michigan, I'm in Ann Arbor at the moment, mm -hmm. and that whole go blue concept and mm -hmm. building that culture and creating that atmosphere is fabulous. Yep, yep. Uh, there's no reason why you can't do both. Uh, right. and, it, and it doesn't happen in Australia like it does here in that 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 team ethos. And you, you see that. You see that across all sorts of sports. And so there's no reason why Australia can't be embracing that concept. And likewise... It'd be great to see the Americans embrace the the sports science and research a little more too. Yeah. Well, in terms of the product that you're putting out, uh, I've actually I've actually got them in my hand here. I've actually still got um, the piece that you you put on you clip on for the outdoors because I used this the other day outdoors. So I'll take off the the outdoor portion of it and I'll just leave myself with the the hand devices. Right. So what what's the idea behind these? How did you come up with this concept and and why? Okay, so let's just change horses for a second and talk about cycling. Right. Twenty odd years ago, uh, a device was created for cycling for bikes, a power meter, and the idea is to measure the effectiveness and efficiency of a cycling stroke on the bike. And in the early days, it was sort of you know, well, what good is that? Twenty years later, there's thirty five different companies that are producing these things. They cost anywhere from a thousand to two thousand um, dollars, but they are two dimensional, as you can appreciate on a bike. You're literally just rotating on that way, mm -hmm. and you can see what your power output is like, and you can adjust your cycling technique. So our idea was to the vision was to come up with a product that could do the same thing for a swimmer, but instead of working in two D, we're working in three D, and we've also got, of course, the challenge of working in water with the ultimate goal to be able to map objectively and get objective data as to what the hands are doing. And and the research shows us that the hands, I mean, this is a paddle from the tip of your fingers to your elbow. All right. Your forearm and your hand create a, the effect. It's effectively a paddle for a swimmer. Right. And so the idea is to measure the effectiveness of what that, and particularly the hand is doing, because the hand leads the forearm. Yep. The forearm doesn't go anywhere until the hand is, has taken it there. Mm -hmm. So the hand is the, the, the primary area of propulsion, and it's right. all about propulsion. And how do, we, how do we measure objectively and take that data, and then how do we adjust our technique to maximise the amount of propulsion we're getting? Right. Mate, it's, it's incredible in terms of just design, what you guys have done here. So, like, it sits so well on the hand like it, it wraps around the outside of your hand here it sits right on the palm there's obviously these uh straps that you can adjust here which are super easy but basically when i was swimming with this the other day as soon as i got it to a point where it was set and comfortable 
I really didn't notice it after the first few strokes. I was, I was, I was able to swim at all different types of speed. So I could swim very slow and it didn't affect me. I could uh, then increase the speed and go as fast as I wanted to. And um, these things sat perfectly. So in terms of, um, you know, the comfort level of being able to use these, it was, it was spot on. So nice job with that. Um, now I have done some swimming with these and I've got some data. So do you want to take a yeah. look at that? Yeah, it, it'll be good. It'll be good to have a little bit of a giggle at, um, <laughs> at some of your art. Oh, I shouldn't say that. It's actually, no, no. it's actually pretty good and pretty impressive. No, it was actually, listen to me, to be honest with you, I, I've swum over the past 17 years and, you know, in the ocean as, as recreation, I'll get in the pool every now and then just for a little fun, but I've just started swimming back again. I think everybody that follows me would understand that uh, I've got back into the pool. I want to get back into health and fitness and I want to get back into some racing. Um, and this is this was the start of it. This was actually day one in the pool of me swimming. So when we're looking at this data, be be kind. Um, but but look, I, I'll, I'll tell you, it was like riding a bike. Like, uh, you know, you just don't forget. Once you learn how to swim properly and once you know how to swim, it was like this muscle memory just came back. And, and I ha definitely had some inefficiencies. It wasn't a, per a perfect stroke, but I felt really good in the water. I felt strong. I felt like I was catching some water. Um, definitely have uh, some ways to go in terms of getting it to where I want it to be, but felt pretty good. So let, let's take a look yeah, at, just, at the first just, be, just before we do, Brett, just a couple of things. You mentioned muscle memory. Mm -hmm. And one of the critical pieces here, it's not just about taking a snapshot of where you are today. Right. And because what we need to do is we need to take a snapshot, look at where your technique can improve, mm -hmm. make right. those changes, right. measure it again, right. look at the outcome of those changes. But then we need to be able to measure it consistently over a period of time so mm -hmm. that you don't slide back into what you've been doing for however many years. Uh, and that's all about, as you mentioned, muscle memory. Right. Uh, and and they, they're, they're super light and we, we leave the fingers free. So we've done everything yeah. we can to make them as unobtrusive as possible. And they weigh less than an ounce, an ounce each, which mm -hmm. is less than a slice of bread. Right. But let's have a look at your data, bud. Let's check it out. Okay. All right. There we are. Okay. Let's, yep. So what we've got here, mate, is two laps. As you can see here, you swam up in Irvine in a 25-yard pool. Mm -hmm. We've got two laps being 50 yards. Uh, this is your total time taken, total number of strokes, your average stroke rate. Now, stroke rate for us is what the Americans call a cycle. Um, mm -hmm. So that's effectively a, a 66 in American parlance, but it's 33 left and right. right. The distance per stroke. Distance per stroke is a little bit misleading because you've got so much time underwater in a short pool like a 25-yard. So you'd, you'd get a better sense for in a 50-metre pool. Yeah. Um, and your average force per stroke, and frankly, it's a pretty high force per stroke. What we've got down here are your two laps. Um, and as you can see, you've got a, an orange and a blue bar. Mm -hmm. Lap one, you've got a slightly more in the blue. That's your right hand. So you're pushing a little bit more force through your right hand than you are in your left. But your left hand is very even. Your, your, your second lap is very even, as you can see. Mm. And this... Green line, green line here is your stroke rate. So you were stroke rate of 33 in the first lap and then you soft cocked it a little bit to 32 in your second lap. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So to, to give you some context here in terms of what I was doing, the, the 50s, I decided to swim long and strong, just, just hold a nice length, feel strong, feel powerful. But um, it was sitting at about 70%, you know, just nice and long and strong and, and and keeping that length. Now, when we look at the 25s, hopefully, I did some 25s here, you'll, you'll see that I, I tried to increase the tempo and the speed a little bit and, and put a little bit more pressure on them. So that just for context, that's what I tried to do. And you certainly did. And we'll, we'll have a look at one of the 25s in a minute. Um, but I'm staying with this one for the moment. So there are your two laps. And if we click on the stroke icon here, we can now look inside your first lap or we can look inside your second lap as well. And we can see what what you're doing and with your right hand and your left hand and you can see you're a little bit i wouldn't call it all over the place but it's slightly mm -hmm. different on each stroke but this is this is the amount of total force that you're pushing through with each hand with your right and your left mm -hmm. what's really critical here though is we look at where those forces are being applied because it's not just about pushing brute force and increasing the total amount it's about then applying it in the best direction to help you 
And so if I click on here, which is your force field, these six numbers up here is what it's all about. Mm. And ideally, this is the the most important one is your propulsion. Mm -hmm. The higher your propulsive number, the faster you're going to swim or the better you'll be as a result of what you're pushing through your hands. So we're able to, we're literally able to dissect that force into six directions, up, down, left, right, forward, and back. Mm -hmm. And by back, we talk about a little bit of hand drag. As you can see, you've got 2.9% hand drag. And what that hand drag is, is that's where you come in for the glide. And if your fingers turn up slightly as you go through the glide, that's pushing that's pushing the palm against the, the face of your palm against water, which is going to slow you down. So if you do that every single stroke, mm. that will be an impediment to speed. Right. Your upward force is at the back end of your stroke when you're, when you're pulling your hand up. Because you, ideally what we want for, for maximum propulsion, we want the hand to go through vertical and perpendicular to the bottom of the Right, pool. right. Not, not slipping water here at any stage, yeah. Precisely. So we want that to go through to the end of the stroke and at the end of the push, and then it's a matter of how you remove your hand from the water and to minimise this. Because what we're trying to do here is everything in these five numbers is robbing propulsion. Mm. So ideally, we want hand drag and upward to be at zero or as close to zero as possible. Mm. Left and right, we all need a little bit of sideways, a little bit of sculling, particularly at the beginning of the stroke, whilst you're feeling to, to catch. Um, so it's we think that your left and right should be somewhere in the three to five percent range. So let's assume that it's four percent each. So if you've got four percent with a hand moving to the left or four percent with the hand moving to the right, and it can be either hand moving in either direction. If you've got four here and four here and zero and zero here, that leaves us 92 percent split between propulsive and downward. Mm. And ideally, because we have to look at this in two different ways. You look at it from a sprinter's perspective or from a distance swimmer's perspective. Because a distance swimmer has got the high elbow catch and has got less downward force, whereas a, a, a sprinter has got this more of a straight arm action going on. So you'll have more downward. Right, right. So for a sprinter, ideally, that 92% should probably be something like 60 62% propulsive and 20 22% downward. Okay. For a distance swimmer, we're probably talking 72% propulsive and 20% down or even 75% propulsive, 17% down. So it, it gives you something to aim for, which then you can adjust your stroke and you can see how, how you go. Mm, makes sense. And again, if, if I click on this, so this is for the lap average. This is your lap average. And if I click on the stroke, we can look at this data for every single one of your strokes. So we can click through here and we can see if there's any pattern going and what that looks like. And you can see your downward is you know, pretty high and your propulsive can come down a little bit at times. And so that's the sort of thing that if if I were you, I'd be looking at and working on how do I how do I get, because here you go, you've got propulsive now coming up near 60% on this stroke and downward below 30%. So you definitely can do it. It's just a question of, you know, how do I do it? And what, what, what do I need to do with my with my technique to be able to get those to be more like that. Mm. So we're, we're talking about um, consistency over time though and, and and balance of the stroke primarily of like making sure that every every hand hit, every hand pull mirrors and mimics the one previous as long as long as possible, right? So that that way, like if you're swimming a hundred all out, then you're not losing that force and propulsion. Exactly, and you, you you want to you want to do that by exploring your hand path, mm. and we can do that on here. We can look at your hand path through the stroke, and as you can see, we've got three views here. Mm. This is the side on view, so we can see the red is your glide, and the blue is your pull, and then the grey is your recovery. Oh, okay, we, we can see the shape of your stroke. This so is I your, keep a so it looks like I keep a low recovery but a deep pull. Yeah. It's it's it is and it's to be expected to be deep because effectively you're a sprinter so yep. you come from you know yep. you come from that straighter arm as opposed mm -hmm. to the high elbow mm -hmm. which would be shallower right and then here is our over overhead so this is like sitting if you had a a drone looking down on top of mm. you and you can see here your right hand <laughs> right here your right hand in your glide has sort of gone inside a bit and then you start this mm. 
S shape that mm. a lot of older people are taught you know, from years ago that you want that S shape, uh, which is not necessarily the case. Well, for me, for me, it was, uh, it feels like a weakness. Like I'm not able to hold the water the way I want to yet, because again, this was kind of day one of me getting back in the pool and the S shape to me is more of a highlight of weakness of like, you're, you're letting go. It's easier to follow that S path than it is to actually grab and hold onto water in a straighter line. Right. And you'll see that when we look at your force versus time mm. and I'll show you the impact of that S shape and how that's impacting your propulsion and minimizing your propulsion and speed. It's, it's, it's having a negative impact. Right. Uh, and that's the sort of thing that we can see here with this data and then work on, okay, what do we need to do to change it? Yeah. Uh, and this, this view here is, is head on. So this is you swimming towards us. And this is showing the sort of hand path that you're going through. Um, over here is a little time slider. So this, we can, we can time every stroke. This particular stroke took 1.69 seconds. Where that red dot is, is where your hand is at the start of the stroke, which lines mm. up with the slider. And if I move the slider, say, halfway down, mm. this shows us the amount of area that you've covered exactly halfway through your stroke. Ah. You've only gone from here to here. Mm. The second half, you go all the way around here. And we can also see the speed of your hand. See, it's traveling at 3.26 meters a second at that mm. point. If I bring it forward a little bit, mm. you see it's, it's now less than a meter a second. Yet when I advance it, if we come down into the recovery, you'll see you're at four and a half meters a second through the mm. recovery. So we're not, a, we're not just able to map your hand path. We're also able to measure the time it takes. Mm. We're also measure to, able to plot where your hand is at any point in that stroke. And we're also able to get the speed of your hand at that particular point. So there's a lot of really interesting data that can come mm. out. Of wow. Wow. And, once, that is interesting. and once you get, once you get your shape right and you, you adjust it and you, you know, you might want to straighten this and you might want to push your glide a little bit straighter instead of coming across your body. Once you get that right, then the goal is we need to repeat that. We want to repeat that as much as we can. And so that's why we have this consistency view where we're able to click on each of these and we're able to look at every stroke for that lap over mm. on top of each other. Wow. And, and this is the interesting view here. Huh? This is the interesting view because you can see you've got a little bit of an asymmetry going on between your left and your right. You've got, you do have an S curve on your right, but the S on the left is more pronounced. Mm. Right. Um, and obviously the, the, the more consistent you are, the, the narrower those those strokes will be, and they'll bump. Mm. Um, so yeah, you've got a you've you got a little bit to work on there, Brett. Yeah, no, I, you know, my left is definitely my weaker arm, right? So like it's it's normal that I'm going to have a more pronounced S on the left because it's weaker, and I'm just I'm just letting go of water there. Whereas on the right, I can hold it a little bit longer, a little stronger, so it's probably a little bit less pronounced, but. Why is why is there so much variation in in terms of like the the path? Why wouldn't the lines be like almost directly on top of each other? Because mate, it's a it's a it's a really difficult world, the world of water, to be able to move through and repeat. So right. there's a guy um, you'll you'll know of Matt Mitchum. You know mm -hmm. Matt yep. Matt Matt won in uh, Beijing. Uh, I think there were eight diving medals in Beijing, eight mm -hmm. gold medals. Uh, seven of them were won, won by Chinese divers, and Matt was the Aussie, won the 10-metre platform. He was mm. the only non-Chinese to win a gold medal in Beijing mm. in, in the diving. This view actually came from, uh, this concept came from our, our principal scientist and my, my co-founder, Dr. Kenneth Graham. He put an accelerometer on Matt. This is leading up to Beijing. And he got Matt to stand still on a, on a, on a, on a gym, gym mat mm. and perform 10 somersaults standing somersaults and he mapped his data in three dimensions from the accelerometer for his standing somersaults and when you overlaid them one on top of each other they were almost absolutely identical wow in terms yeah super impressive but when you've got something like diving which is judged on the perfection of your technique mm -hmm. it's very different to swimming where you're judged on your speed and your time taken from getting from A to B. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're going to beat the Chinese in diving, especially in 10 minutes, you better be 
you better be on the money. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to know what you're doing. Yeah. So, yeah, look, it's not unusual. It's not unusual to see variation. Uh, but the other thing that I look for is the, the asymmetries in here. And quite often you can see a, a significant asymmetry between the left and the right hand. Mm. And it can be down to shoulder issues, flexibility issues. Mm -hmm. it, it can also be down to hip imbalance. And if you've got a, a slight hip imbalance, that'll chuck out your stroke. So the good thing is these highlight those issues and then you can go away with a, you know, like a PT or a physiotherapist and have a look at it and see what's going on. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's, um, let's quickly look at your stroke phases because the stroke phases is where we were able to display the amount of time and the percentage of stroke that you're spending in each of those three phases. So over here, you can see we're looking at the, uh, the, the time spent in glide in pull and in recovery which is pretty evenly balanced actually between the two. This is for the lap average. Mm -hmm. And then over here, we can click on one of these and we can see what your actual data is for that particular stroke here. But where this gets really fun and really interesting uh, is in our force versus time. Now, most people, when I put this on, they all crap themselves a little bit. And I say, look, you know, don't panic. Mm -hmm. Don't panic. It's, it's not that difficult to read. Uh, and there's a couple of interesting things here in your stuff, mate. And, when we look at the 25, it'll be even further enhanced. Mm. So what we're looking at here is just your propulsive phase because we can we can look at total force, we can look at propulsive, we can look at your vertical force, we can even look at your lateral and we can map what's going on in each of those directions. All right, do me a favour here and just explain what each of those phases mean. So what, what is vertical force? What is lateral force? Explain those to me. So vertical force is the force that you're pushing down okay. or up at the back end of your stroke. If you've, okay. got a, if you've got a lousy technique like mine, when your hand exits the water, it faces up and it pushes okay. up, right. which is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and lateral force is if you've got like a big in sweep or an out sweep, that's pushing to the sides. And the reality is... If I want to go forward, then if I've got a lot of force going left or right with either hand, that's sending me sideways. It's not yep. sending me forward. Gotcha. That's why this is so important that we can identify that and then refine that, whether it's a stroke, whether it's mm. a hand path issue mm. or whether it's a hand angle issue because the hand changes angle as it goes through the stroke. Mm, but let's just... Let's just look at. Um, let's just. In fact, let's only. Let's isolate one of these hands. Let's just look at your right hand here. Uh, and like I said, most people sort of have a little bit of a panic when they see this, but it's very easy to read. So each of these is a stroke of the right hand, mm -hmm. and right here where I'm putting that line, that pointer, that's the hand exiting the water. Okay. Where it's straight along here is you're in recovery, so this is where the hand is out of the water. Okay. In here and here, and then here we start the glide. And this from here to here is your glide. Now, mate, your glide here, as you can see, it's gone negative down here. And what that's telling us is you've got a hand drag. Mm -hmm. That stroke here, not here, not here, but this one, your fingers have come in and they've turned up. Here is when you're catching and you're pulling. Maximum peak pull here. And then the pulling comes back down and your hand exits the water and it starts the glide again here. Mm long glide and away you go so you can scroll through and have a look at all of these now it's interesting what you said about your right hand versus your left hand because you've got a couple of tiny little we call these double peaks but these are very small mm. if we go to your left hand you can see they're more pronounced mm. and what's happening here is you're pulling and you're hitting your peak propulsive force then something's happening and it's dropping down. Then something else is happening and it's coming back up. And you can see this pattern is mm. not so much at the end, but here, here, and here, and a little bit here. And what that is, that's your as your left hand is coming through, it's turning in slightly and it's losing water and you're losing propulsion. Mm. And it's rotating back and facing your feet and it's finding it again and then it's going back up. Right. Right. And I think if we look at you on, at pace, no, you've actually held it pretty well. You know, at pace, you've only got this, you've only got a couple here where you've got that pattern going on. 
and we'll try your right hand and see what's going on in your right. Yeah, you've actually got it more in your right hand, mate. You see, mm. this is your 25-yard swim. Mm. So just going back to where we were, though. So this is this is how you read this, and this is the sort of stuff we can see. And where it gets next gets interesting is we can overlay the vertical force as well. And so if I blow these up, now we're looking at the blue is still your propulsive, and here's that hand drag that we identified in here. Mm -hmm. The purple is our downward force, our vertical force. And what you see here, where it's below zero, that's pushing downwards. And where it goes above zero, this tiny little bit in here, this tiny bit in here, that's your upward force, which is minuscule. And you can see it's happening just prior to the hand exiting the water. Mm. So what we'd want to see here is you've got a lot of downward. See, we're peaking at sort of minus seven. So does that mean I'm, I'm pressing on the water? Yeah, you're pressing. Yeah. You're yeah. Pressing. You've got a lot coming down. Yeah. yeah. And the idea is to try and convert that from down into propulsion. Mm -hmm. And so here, it's interesting. You're almost equal here with where you're peaking your, your, your downward force, where you're peaking your propulsive force. You see, you're almost eight here and you're like seven here. I mean, ideally, what you want, mate, is you want this propulsive to be as high as it can be. And if we could have this downward force peaking sort of here at minus four, then that would be able to transfer that energy from down into propulsion, which would make you faster. So give, give me an example of what you think I'm doing and what I could do to correct that. Okay. Now, I can't see myself on here at the moment, so I don't know whether you can see me. Yeah, I can see you. Okay. So if... For example, and, and sprinters are a little bit a little bit difficult because I've, I've worked a fair bit with distance people. So with a distance swimmer, when you when you get to the end of your glide and you, you, you're starting the catch, mm -hmm. you know they've got that high elbow catch and they talk about rolling over a barrel. And it's really how you go from here to here mm -hmm. as relatively quickly as possible with minimal downward force because if you're pushing a lot down like that mm -hmm. that's just wasted energy that's taking you effort to do right. that and right. if you can go from here to here now you're engaged in the propulsive manner and then you're able to get a much better propulsion mm. that makes you faster mm -hmm. and the idea is i mean from a from a triathlete perspective mm -hmm. You can do one of two things. I mean, it's less relevant for a swimmer where you literally want to get from A to B as quickly as possible. But with, right. a tri with a triathlete, you can do one of two things. You can either have improved the time in your swim or you're able to lower your tempo and do the same sort of time, which gets you out of the water feeling fresh for when you get on the bike. Yeah. So it's it's really quite remarkable. And it's it's the same with a distance swimmer. You can You're able to you know, trans, transition from downward to propulsive quicker. You're able then to lower your tempo if you like, and then you'd be, you'll be, um, uh, you'll feel better when you come to the latter part of the swim, and then you can put your foot on the accelerator and you can push yourself harder. Okay. So that's sort of the, the the distancing. Now the principle's still the same for a sprinter. It's just a question of how much instead of having that high elbow catch, how much I can sort of maybe get a bit halfway there, you know, how, 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 how much I can go from that straight arm into just getting into that propulsive phase a bit more. And maybe it's, maybe the hand would be a bit shallower, but remember you've got a much higher tempo as a sprinter, mm -hmm. like a 50 or even a hundred. Right. If you're doing a four or an eight. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Now, the other interesting thing here, mate, that, that we look at isn't just the quantum, the amount of, pressure that you're forcing down here mm -hmm. compared to propulsion. It's also the timing. Mm. And the timing here is really interesting because what you want is you want to you want to get rid of your downward force as early as you can in the stroke because you want that stroke, as much of that stroke, to be about propulsive. So it's actually looking pretty good on this one, mate, where if you look at where we're, we're sitting, where I've put that pointer, you're only at this phase in your propulsion. I see a lot of people where this point here lines up with their peak of propulsion, mm -hmm. which means they've got a real timing issue between their downward and their propulsion. Mm -hmm. But yours is yours is actually pretty early on. 
mind you, as a super elite swimmer, um, I'm not surprised. But yeah, you can see that that pattern as it goes all the way through, so that you can advance that downward in relation to your propulsion. Right. Okay. Makes sense. We can also look at lateral too. We can we can look at what your hand's doing sideways. Uh, in fact, let's have a look at your left hand. It might be a bit clearer on your left hand. So what we've got here is again this gold is your propulsion in your left hand. Mm -hmm. this, this red is your sideways that's force moving to the side. And what you're seeing here, right here, is where you're peaking your in sweep. That's an in sweep. That's your left hand moving to the right. Mm. And where it comes above the zero is actually your left hand moving to the left. So just as before you exit, your hand moves a little bit to the left. Mm. And right. You can see it doing that here and here and here. But here, and, and it's, it's, it's interesting to see how close this drop of force in here where you've got that double peak is how close that peak is in relation to your peak of lateral. See how very close that is in timing. So you're you're losing your propulsion here, and what you're doing is you've got that in-sweep going on, which again reinforces the fact that as your hand is coming through your stroke, it's just rotating in slightly, which is giving you some of that lateral force. It's That's what that lateral force is. It's coming in, right? right, which is coinciding with your dip of propulsion mm -hmm. it's then finding it and it's then stopping the lateral and coming back and as it stops the lateral and faces your feet and pushes again then your propulsion is going up. it's really interesting because as i was swimming i was recognizing weaknesses in my in my stroke and allowing myself to um be comfortable in my stroke right like it was it was much more difficult for me to grab the water hold on to the water and pull it all the way through like it was burning my triceps it was it was forcing my lats were you know like were engaging and so the muscles that i hadn't used in such a long time and yet i i knew where i wanted to put my arm and and where i wanted to pull but i was i was overcompensating by saying to myself, like, let go there and, and take the easier path, right? Like, and so like all this data is actually showing me all the all the things I was saying in my head at the time of like, let go here, make it easier here, you know, turn the hand in. It was it was all these like subconscious things going on while I was making these uh, compensations, you know? And I tell you the other interesting thing, because I saw your, you had some underwater footage of your swimming. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I saw on your Instagram. Yeah. And I saw that. And I saw very clearly uh -huh. your hand as it comes through, it crosses underneath your body, yep. which yep. is what we're doing here, yep. both hands, right? And you could see it very clearly. You could see it very clearly on the head-on video that you shot mm -hmm. of your hand. So, yeah, this is... this is Because really it was comfortable. It was like it's easier to come in. It's, it's softer. It's easier. Like it's harder to hold and pull than it is to kind of let go and slide in, you know? Right. What did Malcolm Fraser say? Life wasn't meant to be easy. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, this is this is what it's all about. You know, yeah. it's it's how do we push ourselves and how do we get better? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a you know this is this is a tool. And if if you if we go back and have a look at you know we we talked about your stroke rate here, which was what sort of sitting on the thirty three to thirty two, but if we go to one of your twenty five yard swims, you know here we got a stroke rate of um, thirty nine. Mm. So you've pushed it from 32 to 39, uh, and we can look at how that evolved. Mind you, you start off, you started off at 44, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? You're really flying when you when you started, and then you you sort of gradually declined yep. down here. Mm -hmm. um, your second swim, yeah, was yeah more consistent in your in your tempo. So your you're really pushing hard here. This is a you know 86 tempo, 43 cycles. Yeah, you know you're you're really pushing quite hard. Yeah, which, which frankly is why, if you look here, you see these two numbers here, 3.14. Mm -hmm. That's the force on average that you're pushing through each stroke. And when your tempo is really pushing hard, you're going to be pushing less absolute force compared to here. See down here, your 250s, mm. you average three and a half and even four. Newton seconds for your for your fifty yard swim here because your tempo was much slower so you were pushing you're able to be, to push a lot more through 
Mm. So there's, it's a matter of finding that balance between tempo, you know, optimal tempo for, for speed mm -hmm. and amount of force and, 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 and how your hand is positioned and how you're generating that propulsion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. But I love it. Now, do you guys prescribe um, test sets per se for like, you know, do you say like, we want you to kind of test this set and then repeat it to people, that, you know, maybe coaches or club teams that are signing up for this? So we're, we're actually in the throes of putting together a certification program because what's right. really important is that when coaches are using this stuff, they need to really know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and it's, and look, mate, if I can understand it, I can assure you coaches can understand it. Yeah. Um, and the other thing as well, from a coach perspective, that sometimes we tend to look at this and go, oh my God, there's so much data. I don't know how, you know, if I've got a number of a college coach, for example, with 60 swimmers, how am I going to be responsible for analyzing all this data from all the swimmers all the time? That's not the case. The goal here is for the swimmers to own their data, mm. the swimmers to do their own analysis. And frankly, you know, what we're talking about here is understanding. In fact, let, let's just have a look at let's just have a look at one of these. So here's a here's an eight lap swim that I did in Indianapolis last week when the the, the U.S. Nationals were on. Mm -hmm. uh, not me, by the way. It was a, another swimmer. Mm -hmm. And so what what the expectation is is that the swimmer needs to understand the basics in here, mm -hmm. needs to understand that it's all about how do I maximise my propulsion. Uh, and, you know, ha having the, the, the right numbers. So if you've got a lot of upward or a lot of hand drag, as this is, then the swimmer can go to the coach and say to the coach, hey, coach, I'm showing, I'm, I'm really, I'm in 4.6% is a lot of hand drag. Help me with some drills as to how I can get rid of my hand doing this. You know, right. is my elbow dropping? Is my wrist dropping? What's happening in my technique that's creating that? Help me get my propulsion to 60 and my downward to 20. Mm -hmm. What drills can I do? And then how often do I repeat those drills? So what's really important is that the coach is not the bottleneck. It's not the, it's not the, the, the conduit that everything goes through. And mm -hmm. certainly from the time that I've spent in a whole bunch of colleges here in the US, when we've got swimmers looking at their own data, they are unbelievably engaged. Mm -hmm. They get into mm -hmm. this. They love to see what's going on. And once they understand the idea that I want to maximize my propulsion in conjunction with what's going on with my hand path, right? So this was this guy in Indianapolis um, who actually was pretty um, pretty consistent, as mm. you can wow. But, you know, very different to you. You know, he's got that sort of question mark going on, mm. but, but pretty well balanced between two. Mm. So what can I do to refine my stroke technique to maximize my force field, my propulsion? How do I go about doing this? That's right. where the real skill is for the coaches then to be able to say, okay, this is what we're going to do. Awesome, man. I love it. I love it. Well, you know, what you're doing as well is you're, you're equipping the athletes with more understanding of their, um, you know, I, I used to always liken it to kind of like a, a Formula One car, right? Like you have the Formula One driver who sits in the car. They, they don't necessarily build the car and they've got all these gadgets and gizmos that they have to master. But, the, you know, what the what the engineers have tried to do is simplify it so that the the – Everything is in their control right here on the, on their on the hand paddle, right? So they can just accelerate. They can, you know, it's all kind of tap 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 these days with these Formula One cars. And but the the the, the ones that have the better understanding are the ones that drive the car the smoothest, right? And well, and they and they can name, feel it, you know. Let's let's name them: Etten Senna, Michael right. Schumacher, right? Lewis Hamilton, yeah, right? Verstappen. These yep. guys get mm -hmm. very deeply into what's going on with the right. engine. Exactly. Right. Yeah, and then and they can they can now. I saw this video the other day, and I may have, I may have mentioned this before. Is like they can close their eyes and listen to the sound of the car and tell you what track they were on when they did that. That's how that's how deep they are getting with this understanding. And and this is where we're getting here now with the analysis of what you're doing. Is like when I when I pull, I can immediately tell where I'm holding on and letting go because I've I've dug into the analysis and the data and the more you understand it the better you get at being able to then make that quick adjustment you know as as you need it um 
when you become more proficient with understanding the data itself. And the and the, the critical piece, Brett, like I said before, it's not just taking a snapshot today. It's then seeing what the outcome of those changes are. Right. You know, so if my goal in here is to get my left and right from seven and six down to three to four each and to remove my hand drag completely mm -hmm. and then to get my propulsion up to 60, 65 and my downward down to 20, there's a number of different things that I need to do. And you can't change everything all at once. Mm -hmm. You've got to work on one thing, measure it, measure the outcome and keep monitoring it. Once you've got that right, go to the next one, right? Yeah. And the hand drag is the easiest one, frankly, because, you know, you just got to concentrate on that hand coming in like that and, and aiming downwards right. and not popping up. So you can, you can do that until, as you mentioned before, muscle memory. Yeah. Then, you know, how do I remove some in-sweep and out-sweep either in hand path or in hand rotation? Because the rotation of the hand is a killer. Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's, it's the, that principle of the full face of the hand facing the feet and pushing towards the feet is right. critical. And if you've got a, if you do have a, a, because of your musculature, if you do have a hand path that's got a fair bit of sideways motion, you can still do that. But what you want to do is work on that hand, always facing your feet and not turning in and turning right, out. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it's when it turns in and turns out, that's when you lose that propulsion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, uh, that's awesome. Um, tell me this, Jamie, where, where, where do people get access to this and, and how, and what, what, you know, what's the availability now of this? So we did a small run earlier this year, which then sold out pretty much straight away. And we've just got, um, uh, our, our mass batch has come in a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so we sell these online at, uh, eolab.com. Mm -hmm. Um, we're in the middle of finalizing a, a distribution partnership with Swim Outlet as well. Mm -hmm. Swim Outlet are going to be our North American partner for um, distribution for, for sales in the Swim Channel. Mm -hmm. But you know, they're available at eolab.com. Um, it's two components, and I know people probably have the, have the ships when they hear that, you know, it's a hardware cost and also a membership cost, but frankly, the amount of work that is continually done, we're upgrading the software every two weeks. We're constantly making improvements and changes. Mm -hmm. right. well, we've talked here primarily about, um, uh, about or we've talked just about freestyle so far, but we've got backstroke and butterfly coming in two weeks. So, I mean, we, we can already do it now. So this is, for example, this is a butterfly swim that you see here. Mm -hmm. Instead of seeing the consecutive left, right, left, right, left, right, Mm. Be there together. So, what we'll what we'll end up doing here is having them in pairs, you know, left and right, okay. and so yeah. on, so that you can see exactly. I mean, some of these strokes you can see there's a massive overdominance of left hand over right, but primarily they look okay. Yeah, and likewise, you can also today we can interrogate the force versus time. So if I go into just the propulsive here, you, you can see the patterns that are happening. You know between the left hand and the right hand through that butterfly stroke. Yeah. And, right. back, and backstroke as well. We can see this is a this is a hand path for a backstroke. Mm. So we can already see that, but we just need to slightly format it differently for those individual strokes. Breaststroke is a challenge um, yeah. because we work on the principle of hand coming in and hand exiting the water, which doesn't happen with breaststroke. So breaststroke is going to take several months longer. Um, but right now, Freestyle is perfect. Back and back and um, and butterfly Fly. available now. And even you can even look at the force versus time on breaststroke today. It's just mm. a question of you know how we how we interpret that data. So it needs a bit of work. So yes, mate. Um, there's the 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 hardware cost to start, and then there's a a small monthly fee for a membership. Mm -hmm. um, now I believe uh, the people that are listening to this uh, and and use one of my codes get uh, some discount, right? Yeah, exactly. So if you if you do use use Brett's code, you'll get nine months free membership that comes mm. with the handsets. Nice, nice. Um, and the 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 other beautiful thing about this sort of stuff is it enables you then to be able to have remote coaching opportunities. Whether you're a swimmer with a remote coach or a coach working with remote swimmers, if they've got access to these, if they're using these, then right. the coach is able to look at this data and able to to isolate things and and talk about stuff that's going on. 
Yeah. Now you're doing a bit of a U.S. tour. You're you've got some uh, other U.S. coaches that are really into it right now. I know you're working closely with Jonty Skinner, who's one of the most respected coaches uh, in in the swimming world too, right? Yeah, Jonty's amazing. In fact, we're just uh, Jonty. We're talking with Jonty right now about him driving the certification process. So mm -hmm. he's the guy that's basically going to going to going to work the system out for certification to be able to make sure that swimmer that coaches mm -hmm. not only because it's it's one thing is being able to read the data mm -hmm. and the other is okay then how do we what changes do we implement so we've got to make sure that those coaches fully understand the best way to implement it for the benefit of the swimmer because the last thing we want to see is uh, you know a coach who doesn't really know what they're doing implementing changes that are not just not not beneficial but detrimental to the swimmer yeah uh, and i'm also working very closely with mike bottom uh who's uh, you know just about about to retire from the university of michigan as head coach mm -hmm. and mike's also a former yeah. olympic coach but mm -hmm. mike and i are putting together a, a program which we'll settle on and i think we're probably going to get a, a cluster of coaches who have qualified to be in this cluster by having coached swimmers to Olympic and World Championship medalists. Um, and then mm -hmm. that'll be a cohort of coaches that will be exclusively available for people who buy this to be able then to use their services to get, you know, awesome. the, the very best level coaches. Awesome. Well, count me in on that. I've done that. And I'm also um, using the product myself as a swimmer. So I'm, do I'm doing both. So um so I love it, mate. I, I, I love the technology. I love the idea of being able to understand what's going on at a much deeper level. I think this is uh, awesome for swimmers and coaches, the technology. Like I said, it's it sits so well on the hand. It's it's um, very, very simple to use, very easy to download. It comes with an app uh, where everything's accessible. So I was able to see my data immediately um and uh and understand it so yeah listen man i appreciate it. we're going to put all this in the show notes as well so i'll put my codes up there i'll put the links into where you can buy the product where you can um, access it all that kind of stuff so um yeah let me, man, let I, me I show it. you one more can i show you one more thing that's a quite interesting mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. so this is a sprinter we did in uh, michigan mm -hmm. and um let's just have a look at his propulsive and Immediately, you can see this double peak that's going on where the hand's turning, coming, turning in. But the other thing that stands out here is the gallop. Mm. In Australia, we call it catch up. Over here, we call it a gallop. Um, so here you've got left and right hand very close together. And then okay. we've got a big gap in here, in here, and in here. And we know from the research, Brett, that the very best swimmers and the best times have a lower level of acceleration and a lower level of deceleration. Mm. The worst swimmers accelerate high and decelerate low. Mm. So you want to have a smoother swim. And what you're seeing in here is no propulsion at all. There, there, there. Because you, because of this gallop, he's going left, right, left, right, mm. left, right. It means he's got high acceleration here and no propulsion here. A lot of mm. deceleration it's purely body drag mm. so the ability to see stuff like this and to diagnose it and then track it and make the changes and then look for a more consistent left right left mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. is very it. significant yeah huge huge and a lot of people don't realize they're making those mistakes until they see the data like that the amount of guys and even coaches i mean coaches tell me that they bash their head against a brick wall trying to get swimmers to acknowledge the fact that you know you're doing x y and z and they say no i'm not mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. once you can show them this it's yeah. pretty hard to run away from the facts yeah well jamie i love it um as new things come up for for the company and as new um developments happen just uh, keep us informed and we'll we'll let our listeners know as well um we appreciate you guys being supporters of our podcast um we're in the same business of trying to make swimming better as well. So uh, we love to partner with people that have uh, that, that same goal in mind. So appreciate Thanks. it, mate. Thanks, yep. mate. And it's such an amazing podcast. I'm so I'm honored to have been invited. Thanks, buddy. Yep. No worries. Anytime. All right. Take care, buddy. Cheers, buddy.